I okay. Go oh, cool. to Gary's Krispies and work. There's it's in West Dallas. Gourmet Rice Krispies. Oh, yes. yes. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yes. Well, we have yes. employees up at Carrie's Krispies on Tuesdays. Um, and we have yeah, the sell them to the staff, you know, oh give God. them an opportunity to yeah, have them and then our kids fill the order. And it's magic. So I, will, oh, I will forward you the order form so that you yeah. can also participate. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Kelsey. I work really close to that place. So, okay. Uh, referendum update. So means yeah. That's right. Okay. Sorry. No, let's continue talking about the good things we're doing. I know. It feels good. So we're just uh, looking to provide you with an update. Now, last meeting that we had, we had the annual meeting kind of looked at the financial aspect of the referendum and also just the district as a whole. So I want to take a little snapshot of um, the conversations we've had on initiatives related to the referendum specifically. And I would just say, Deidre, Christy, Carey, at any time, if you want to jump in free, um, this is really the district show, not just mine. So um, as you all know, we uh, successfully passed a referendum in April. And the, the initiatives related to that referendum were to ensure that students remain safe, supported, and successful. Uh, so that referendum um, was for $2 million per year for the next five years, and this year being the first year. Uh, so the intent was to put $1 million towards staff retention and recurring costs within the district, um, and then the rest towards safety, technology, and curriculum initiatives within the district. Um, so the so tonight, just going to look to kind of look at a couple of these areas. So with safety, I mentioned um, in the previous board me meeting that we are engaging with a um, ATS to uh, revamp our security camera fleet throughout the district. Now, this is one of those initiatives that, you know, is not as fancy. You don't necessarily see that. But we see you, right? <laughs> so um, there are cameras throughout the district now, and um, there were already, but we're updating the fleet and we're adding to it. Uh, so we've, we're looking at about 48 cameras have been added so far and throughout the course of the project looking to add over 100 views throughout the district. Uh, so when we initially scheduled the project, um, we were hoping that we could leverage non-student days and primarily work on those days such that by the end of the school year would be completely done. There's a lot of this project, as you can imagine, which is just someone standing on a ladder installing a camera. And that's something that really can be done when students are in class and then when students are in the hallways, you fold up the ladder and you wait a couple minutes and then they keep working. So as a result, uh, the initial plan was to have the high school done at this point and then kind of continue to work throughout the district. As we sit here today, the high school Blakewood and Luther are all done. Um, so the middle school is going to be the last school that we do in June. And at this point, we're on schedule or really ahead of schedule to the point where we're looking to have this project completed by the end of by the, in the next four months here. So really coming up quite quick. Um, so Bill Wesley has been doing a tremendous amount of work with this entire project, programming the cameras. Uh, so each camera that is added might have multiple views on it. Um, so making sure that those views are programmed within our system, that uh, administrators can utilize the camera system efficiently. And so far, it's been moving very smoothly. So this whole entire project is some $300,000, and we're very excited to have it completed um, within this, this school year. The other in safety initiative, another safety initiative we'd like to discuss is traffic. Um, so we discussed in the last board meeting, obviously, we have change the traffic pattern and student drop off and um, and pick up uh, here at the high school and middle school campuses. So you have to imagine back in April when the referendum was passed, we as an administrative team decided, okay, we need to get bring in a traffic study a tra group of tra traffic engineers to professionally assess the situation and make recommendations. We're able to secure a contract, get them in in May and they were able to observe several days of traffic, and then it took them about a month and a half or so to actually put it together and give us the 39 page report that we have that's posted on the district website. Uh, so the goal tonight isn't necessarily to go through everything on that document, by all means, feel free to go through it. It's on the district website, but just to kind of go over some highlights. So 
Um, like we discussed the last board meeting, door eight, which is right over here, um, has been closed for student entry at the beginning of the day and for students to leave at the end of the day. Uh, so I can include a, the, a screenshot of the aspect of the report, which specifically notes that door eight should be closed and that traffic at the high school should be oriented towards the circle drive on the other end of the building. Uh, so we were able to communicate um, with the community about these changes. The principal at the high school uh, was able to send out daily videos, updating, making updates as we went along, um, hearing feedback and trying to be responsive to that free feedback. Uh, we are still hiring for crossing guards. And I will say, so we currently have one who is staffed with us and is doing an amazing job on 15th and Cherry. And then after she helps middle schoolers cross, she actually goes to Rawson on um, 15th and Maple and helps students cross there. Uh, so we are trying to, to fill other positions um, at the beginning and the end of the day um, in order to get 15th and, and, um, and Beach staffed as well, as well as helping out with the other end of the high school. But as you can imagine, it's been a, it's been a, a tough bit of a tough journey getting additional staff to, to, to want to do that. Um, oh, that looks like the video is playing one second here. So some things the city on. So I'll just say that obviously we don't own the streets. There's a, there's a limit to what we can do as a district. And it really takes a partnership with the city to do a lot of these initiatives. Um, and we've, have a, a good working relationship with the city and so far so good. Um, I've had several meetings with the city engineer and um, just been talking about what's next and trying to look at that 39 page report and try to discern what is really within the realm of possibility and what isn't. Um, so I've included a couple screenshots here. We are looking to add bump out crosswalks along 15th Avenue at certain key intersections. So such as on Beach, Walnut and Cherry Streets. Uh, so those concrete bump outs would work to provide safer crossing for students and would also um, calm traffic down and make it slow down a bit such that students can cross more safely and efficiently. Uh, so there is, you can see there's sidewalks on both on this image as well. I will just note and emphasize that that aspect we're really look, working on this with the city. Nothing, none of this has been definitively defined and decided upon yet. Um, discussions are preliminary still. We're still working out the technicalities and really getting designs from the traffic engineers who initially did the study uh, so that we can discern what is within the realm of possibility here. But as we look, our crystal ball, if you will, as we project ahead, uh, we are looking at at least those crosswalks in this image here. And also uh, one of the higher priority initiatives that would be adding a beacon, a traffic beacon uh, for cross, for pedestrians on Rawson Avenue immediately south of the elementary school. Um, and you can see that in the image directly in the bottom right of the screen. Um, so to help students cross the street instead of potentially jaywalking across Rawson, providing more safe crossing there. Some aspects that we're not considering within the report. So there are some aspects that are just cost prohibitive and some things that we've just come to the conclusion practically would, would not really work. Uh, so as far as cost prohibitive initiatives are concerned, you can look at that um, that, that roundabout on 15th and the Parkway, um, likely not something that we can do within the budget or timeframes that we're looking at here. Um, it would also cause a rather large disruption to the population of the community of South Milwaukee. Um, definitely something that the traffic and engineers recommend, and can, there's definitely value to that uh, objectively as far as traffic mitigation is concerned, but not something we're pursuing at this time. There were also a couple of recommendations relating to moving the playground at Rawson Elementary. And as you can imagine, if you're moving a playground, just building a playground is astronomically expensive. Um, so we really did not entertain those possibilities. Um, that doesn't mean that we have to, we can throw those things out wholesale. There are aspects of those those ideas that we can still take into consideration. But for the most part right now, the the emphasis and the, our our time and efforts really going towards getting crosswalks and bu concrete bump outs on 15th Avenue and along Rawson there. 
Oh. That would be on the Parkway and 15th, but that's that's really not on the table. Yeah, but that's a nice little image. Yeah. Um, there were also some suggestions if people have read the traffic study about altering the start times between the middle school and high school um, kind of significantly. But again, those are ones that we thought that's such an inconvenience for families that we did not choose to pursue a few of the other things that they suggested because the value and what it would bring just seemed to the negative parts of it seemed to outweigh the value that some of those pieces would bring. So we really tried to take the report um, and I will say, share with everyone that the city of South Milwaukee has been incredible to work with through this whole process. They're such nice partners um, with us as a school system. And the new city engineer has been out front. She's met with Dan a number of times on different things that have been suggested in the traffic study. And so we're really grateful to the partnership and to the support. Um, and that's allowing us to sort of filter through some of these things that the traffic engineers gave quite a laundry list of things that they would suggest we do. Some are great ideas for us and others just probably aren't realistic for us in the process. Just for the people out there, what's the current drop off times and what was the, so what were the ones that we didn't accept? Um, well, the current drop off times are the same as they were in previous years, right? So we kept the start time the same at the middle school and at the high school. Um, they would have suggested making like the start time of the middle school a good 25 to 30 minutes different than the start time and end time at the high school. Um, that's okay. right. That would be the kind of difference you'd need to only be having one set of traffic. But then if you were a family trying to drop off someone at the middle school, what they would recommend that then you come back again a half an hour later. And so those aren't suggestions that we thought were realistic for anybody. So this, the, the crosswalk south of, of Ross that we have added, I'm trying to kind of imagine that. So like on 15th is a crosswalk and then what is that? 17th? Is before, yeah, it's before the 17th. Right almost. in between? Yep. Yep. So there's actually so on, on this image here, there's actually you can kind of see where that sidewalk goes north. Um, there's that's actually one of the entrances or the entrance to the parking lot at Ross. And so it'd be right across the street from that. I'm trying to diminish like the, the traffic district. I don't I purposely don't drive by that way. Yeah. Sure. Would be that helpful to have I mean we're talking like 25 feet. Yeah, so the, what, what the traffic engineers noticed, there were several students crossing, jaywalking. We're going to do it anyway, so we might as well make it. Yeah, so it, it, they go exactly. So it's it's one of those situations where that that road specifically is quite heavily trafficked, and you have young kids crossing Ross and jaywalking, really. And so this provide they're going to do it anyway, like you said, so it's just the, the providing the safer avenue with a lighted beacon for them to cross safely. Yeah, it's siphon the kids in that direction because 15th and Rawson, you know, kids are walking against the light all the time. People are trying to, you know, cut in different directions in the intersection when they have the right of way. But, you know, some kid juts out. Yeah. So, yeah, if you're able to pull the, the foot traffic even, you know, a little bit in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. And part of it is the just the visual that that reminds people to slow down and pay a bit more attention as well, which is part of what they noticed. And I even noticed as I've been out there paying attention to the traffic patterns and parking far back to watch it is it's not super obvious that there's a school there until there's a school right there. Right. And so that's some of what they just want to make sure that we're bringing the attention to the, you know, Hey, there's a school right here and we should be slowing down and those kinds of things. Crosswalks seem to help that quite a bit. It seems like the people driving up 15th and well, either direction, it's it's already contentious and people are already, you know, aggravated behind the wheel. Would the bump outs add to that aggravation? Is there going to have to be like a learning curve? There would certainly be a learning curve. curve. Yeah. So the, the main thing, the priority is student safety, right? Yeah. yeah. Which this across the street safely. Yeah. Um, so there would certainly be a learning process in order to to make sure that you know, cars can move and pedestrians can move together. Um, but with that priority in mind, you know, the having communities that have those bump outs, they find that traffic usually slows and they're less likely to speed through even when there's less traffic. Um, so 
the exact ramifications we'll have to see it we could we're having even discussions about you know can you put cones out to kind of test this out before you actually put concrete down um, those are suggestions within the study and things that we're discussing at an administrative level um, but it certainly would have an impact on traffic slow the, the, yeah you know there study yeah. show that traffic actually slows correct yeah. correct they recently oh. added one of those at the turn where i dropped my sons off at high school and the community was up in arms about it before it got put in um right because it was different and that's going to make things go so much slower that has not been the case um it actually has made things move so much more smoothly to be able to take the left hand turn you have to mm -hmm. in order to get on the road to drop them off at the high school so it, they have been a tremendous advantage to just that being so much safer for cars and for foot traffic. Yeah. Would one of these bump outs be like right before you turn into the middle school, like kind of round, like circle? Yeah. Right. Circle? Yep. So if you look on that, that image to the left, you see yeah. Cherry Street, that's like the entrance of the circle okay. drive. And then immediately north of that will be the exit of the circle drive. So there'll be some bump outs. You can see that kind of bumping out into the street on that image. So there were cones out there a handful of days, yep. um, kind of like not having, not allowing people to drop off directly in front of that driveway. And then there was a little bit, bit of congestion. I will fully agree yep. with people like dropping off ahead of the cones and then trying to merge back into that lane. Um, uh, but it'll be interesting. Like, I like the idea of how it would be. Um, but I, I is the goal, I think, I think the goal is to, um, and keep me honest, obviously the goal is to keep the kids safe, but do yep. we want the kids to be dropped off on 15th Avenue, be, like in between, in the four section? Yeah. So, yes. is that the goal? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the four, I'm trying, yes, the four. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say between Cherry and Walnuts, uh, or really cherry, between Cherry and Beach. Um, right. is, is all you can drop students off right so like the, there. yeah so like, we did make a video about that and sent it out to the middle school families which did yeah. help a bit to get people moving further yeah, up good. versus yeah. making some congestion at the back end that yeah. helped quite a, bit. a little bit at least yeah. to keep traffic flowing out there yeah, yeah. um so yes yeah, so we we would want to encourage traffic to to drop off um between cherry and beach um, because a lot of that problem that we do see south of Cherry is people parking or at least dropping off immediately at Cherry right. and then moving on. Um, so they can do that, but the problem is you've caused congestion south of Cherry. Um, so one of, the, one of the issues that you saw with that those cones was it was kind of a drastic, and now here's the cone and stuff. Yes. So the bump out is a little <laughs> more gradual, right. right? Not to say it's not completely, it is a little drastic, but it's you can see it in the image there. You come up on it, but it is elongated a bit more than just having two cones there. Um, so if we were to actually put cones out to, you know, show where the bump outs would be, we would have them out for a little period of time. We'd like to have probably a little bit more sturdy cones and something you could just drive over. Um, but that's other communities have tested it out in different different methods. And we're just trying to weigh our options at this time. Maybe construction barrels. So. Yeah. See how that goes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and like Dan said, these are not, we've paid for them and they're in the works to go outside, sure. but they are part of what we're continuing to pursue with the city to figure out if they are the right next move for outside. And does that work with some of what the city has planned as well? Um, because while we'll be contributing dollars to do all of these things, the city actually has to do the work too. Mm -hmm. So um, making sure that we're doing a few of the things in front of Ross and those are in the we're committed to and a bunch of those things are actually in the works to be happening and some of these other pieces we're still trying to make sure that that is the right next step for how to solve continue to solve the problem that we're having i will say we have significantly fewer students running across the middle of 15th every morning so our goal of addressing some safety concerns we have made significant progress at addressing some of the safety concerns and um we're not having some of those, this was new to us, drop off issues that we were at the start of school either. So I think it was definitely a move in the right direction. And so some of the other things that they suggested as people who do this for a living, because the same thing, Andy, I looked at some of it and I was like, I don't even know what that would do, right? Um, but for the people who do this for a living, have already served us quite well in some of the suggestions they've made. So we'll keep at it and 
see what we can do to always be addressing the student safety. I have one question. I went through, um, I went past Oak Creek High School on their drop off time or pickup time. And I noticed that they've got like the, the signs, obviously, but they've got like, it's, it's a, it, this is flashing, right? It's 15 miles per hour in this. When it says flashing beacon, is that what that means? Like that? So that one specifically on Ross and yeah. would be less about speed limit, but yeah. more, but it would be flashing. Yeah. Um, okay. It would be like a student crossing. So if a student wants to cross the street, they hit the button. Or okay. Ideally, they start walking and then it starts flashing automatically. Okay. Um, the exact mechanism will have to iron out, but there will be a flashing light saying, hey, there are, there are, there are people crossing here. So. Kind of like quantify when we know we've, been successful with this like if this is in the next year or so like what if it how would we judge at the end of this year if it's like you know what we don't actually need this stuff like what's what are we gonna look at yeah so i think that's where the the testing with cones comes in we we try it out and we be outside and we take and a look to, to yeah. be, i don't necessarily mean like the, the bump outs in particular just like the whole project of traffic on 15th and ross and yeah and i think so the tricky thing is that it's notes this in the report we're going to have at times of high traffic at the beginning and end of the day. And we're going to have to learn to live with it to some extent. It's not a completely solvable problem. And it says that in the study. And it's more of how do we make things as safe as possible for kids and try to work within the constraints that we have. Um, so It's a harder thing to quantify yeah. though, right? Because <clears throat> how many cars are currently traveling up and down 15th? Well, we didn't really, I mean, the traffic study counted and did all of those things, but just on a few smatterings of time. So it is a harder thing to say if we reduce traffic by 10%. Well, we have no way to measure that. Without. And, and, to redo yeah. the study again. So, and that would be a lot of expense for, I'm not sure if that would be the measure we would look for. Some of how we're measuring right now is just the difference in what you can you know, if you were out there doing traffic in the morning a year ago versus now, we can physically see quite a bit of difference. Um, and some of it is the feedback we're getting from parents as well, right? And so those are kind of the metrics we're using right now. But it is a really hard one to say, you know, I can, it's, cameras are easy. We had this many and now we have this many, right? Like, Shame, like all those things have a number. So like those it. are easy to come back to the community and say, here is the thing that that actually did. This one is a bit harder for that to find the actual measurement that we would, we would have. Because fortunately we haven't had too many students get in accidents or whatnot out front, right? Which is what we're trying to prevent. So certainly there's nothing to like reduce when it comes to some of those things. That's a challenge. For me, it had me with the fewer breath. I've seen these breathtaking moments mm -hmm. where just this once, I'm having my kid rush across the street because I'm in a hurry. And every day there's one or two kids that parents that used to do that. And if that goes down remarkably, that's a goal. Right. That's a goal. Yeah, we just didn't have numbers. Right. And you want to make sure that anytime you invest dollars in something, it has a measurable outcome. That one's just harder for us to say, okay, now we've finished with everything that we can do around the traffic and the traffic in particular, that's a hard one to know. Okay. That was just enough things to do or not quite enough yet. Um, but we'll keep at it and keep getting that feedback from the community and keep watching as best we can and just report back as often as we can um, on what we're seeing and, and how it it's, you could tell the difference, but the measurements are a little tougher. And I would just say, it's not like, let's just say a year from now, we we get these bump outs and we, th we think it's working okay. It, it's not something we just wash our hands up and say, mission accomplished. Uh, it's, we got a 39 page report that we can look at all their efficiencies to make. It's just at this point, these are the things that we're saying we could do in the next year. We don't want kids running across the street right. in every in every area, and we've had kids that have been hit on, you know, on the on the corner, and we've had in my lifetime here in the district. You know, we've had several kids, um, and so. Yeah, to your point, I mean, it's hard to measure, but um, I think the fact that we don't see as many kids running across the street 
is already an improvement. So so a couple of weeks ago, there was a group that was on Ninth and Milwaukee. I forget the, the, who the name was, but they actually were speed checking cars. The fastest car going down Milwaukee Avenue, do you think how fast it was going? Anyone? 53. So what Clint mentioned was bump outs and how they work with you know people slowing down is if it's 20, if you're hit by a car that's 20 miles or lower, your chance of survival are like 80, 90%. Once you get over 20 miles per hour, it's exponential on you having some serious, serious injuries or fatalities. So knowing that there's a lot of speed, and I think a lot of this, when these bump outs are built, people will get to, will get to use them and understand why they're being used. Um, and then hopefully it'll not be the racetrack that it used to be, or it, it just makes sense to go through with, with all of these. If it's a minor inconvenience to a couple of people that are upset about it, I would hate to be that family that was upset that their child got hit and we didn't use our referendum money to improve our drop-offs. And then I know that we've got 15th in the parkway, but I think we all know using 15th coming south, you basically, even if you don't touch your gas, by the time you hit that bottom, you are at 30, 35. And that's just without touching your brake. So I know we didn't look at this and, and that, that area, but we all know as people in South Milwaukee that as you come down that hill, unless you brake, you're gonna hit that intersection 30, 35. So I don't know if we're gonna look at that eventually on that end, but I'm glad we're focused so far on, on this node of travel. I know with the crosswalks, I've seen some less drastic use of also not a big bump or whatever that we see across on South Shore. I know in the new construction over in Cudahy, they call it, um, what's that, like a hump. And this is this little mellow one. So even if you want to cross it, I think the way it's designed, if you want to cross at 25, you'll get a little bit, but you're not going to get completely um, bounced around in your car. So something else that the engineers might want to suggest that still during that time, off time, people coming through will still be conditioned to try drive at 25 through this intersection. So I think it's a lot of education on all of us in South Milwaukee that this little sec, these sections are very important that we do follow the speed limits for safety, which part of a referendum. Another aspect with safety is where we have been testing out a, um, a keyless lock system with Proxis. Um, so we have, we've set up a couple of these locks and it looks just like the image is shown here on the presentation, set these up in the district office and with the, within the operations department and have just been testing on that, testing them out. So the way this is different than say our external doors is it's Bluetooth uh, powered instead of um, with a, with a hardwired connection to a, a fob system like you have on our external doors. Installing one of these is a couple hundred dollars as opposed to installing a hardwired keyless entry is several thousand dollars a door. Um, so with it being Bluetooth, if the internet goes down, you can still use it. Um, if the Wi-Fi goes down, you can still utilize it. There's several different keyless lock systems that utilize Wi-Fi or a hardwired system into the network. Um, so we we like the the flexibility of this system. Um, we also like the cost of it. Um, so we've been trying to look at it and determine if it's worth beta testing at an elementary school. Uh, so we're I would say we're at the concluding phase of testing it in the district office, and we're more seriously considering field testing it at a school. Um, and we'd be if we did that, we'd be looking to probably do that in the springtime um, to try to test it out a little bit more and get some more objective data from from staff as to how it works. It does require a different fob than what we utilize on the external doors. Um, and there are some ways to be creative with it. You could potentially put it on the back side of an ID card and then the external doors on the front side of the ID card. So then you have one ID card that gets you in and out. Um, but these are just different, that's a downside of the system. And we've been trying to see if that downside is still worth all the benefits that we see. Namely, you can instantaneously shut down any door that you need. You have that digital 
log of who uses what doors. If you give a fob to a substitute and that substitute decides not to come back, you can shut down the fob. And also it's worth noting all these doors can use the same as what we currently use, or at least for the most part. Um, so as a result, you can actually use the same physical key and not have to rekey all the physical keys. You can essentially keep that and have a have a digital system as well. So we really like it so far. It's just a matter of making sure other options. Proxis is fairly proprietary. Um, so there's not too many other systems specifically that utilize Bluetooth. Um, there are other school districts that utilize the system, uh, one specifically in Wisconsin. We've reached out to all these different places and they've received very positive reviews so far. It's fairly new. So in the, it's, it's been in the field for about six years, which is a bit shorter than some other lock systems that have been out for like 20 years or so. Um, but we like what we see and looking to test it at an elementary school. So just to interject, I've been doing security at Summerfest. We have something like this. So the GM key works on everything. You can as you can have like a little fob. You can also put it on someone's ID card. Um, out of all the locking systems that we have in that ground, this is the one when we go to do security and we see it, we're like, okay, this one, we know exactly how it works. And if we have the little fob, we can open it. If the fob's disabled, your GM key opens it. It's a very good system to use for security. Plus, as you said, you can take the fob away, you can, and the person will be deactivated. So it works quite well. This question because it really is um, assuming it runs off battery. Does. And what that does it look like on that? Yeah. yeah, so it does, it runs on double. <laughs> Oh, and that, that was something we were a little critical about. But like, okay, how often do we have to replace these? And what's the deal if you have it external? We're not looking to do it on an external door, but we're in Wisconsin, right? So like, what does the weather do to these doors? Um, we've found so that we have obviously been testing it for a little over, I'd say two months at this point. No battery needed to be replaced. Um, the users say that it maybe like once a year that you have to replace the batteries. The deal is since it's going off Bluetooth and not say Wi-Fi, it's not constantly on. It active, it turns on when you have something within the vicinity that can connect to it. So it's not draining battery 24 seven. And that's actually one of the key highlights of it. Um, so it's something we're critical of, but so far. Yeah, it's really similar technology to what hotels are going with in a lot of cases now, like where they can send you a mobile key and you can open up your hotel room from your phone versus actually going to the desk and getting a card. It's very similar to that kind of technology. So we have an app that we can use to unlock the door or you can use. And did you say these will not be used in external? No, no, because the external doors are good. We, we have a, we have a hardwired uh, keyless entry system for our external doors. And that currently gets us, you know, the, the data that we need. Right. Okay. Um, Good. So the, the other, another update we want to bring to you is technology. So um, Brian and I have been working closely as far as getting new, uh, new line panels into our classrooms. We just approved an order to get um, about $50,000 worth of, of new lines into our schools. Um, so this is integral into helping maintain our fleets. Uh, so te the technology department has received an additional about $300,000 to help maintain a replacement cycle within the district um, to, to help ensure a uniform standard of technology throughout our classrooms. Um, they have also done a tremendous amount of work on the network. And that's something just like the cameras doesn't really give you a lot of press, if you will. It's not something you see very easily. Um, but as we're adding security cameras, as we're looking to potentially add um, lock system, keyless lock systems, we have to work on that network in order to, to add the ability to get the technology going. Um, so we're making progress there as well. Um, we have hired on three new STEM teachers and have been working in our classrooms in our elementary schools to add STEM spaces. We have a video hyperlinked on this, this presentation showing the, the how some of that work has been done in our classrooms, changing it uh, from what it was in the previous school year to a more 
um, innovative STEM space. Uh, so this is something that we've been really proud of and we students have already been seeing a lot, huge benefit of that and teachers as well. Um, if you haven't seen that video yet, um, I would highly encourage you to watch it. It's actually, um, we purchased a time-lapse camera. So it just took pictures like over this and you can see how quickly a room goes from what looks like nothing to something. Um, and again, credit to our teachers who have put in so many hours getting those rooms and spaces ready and our facilities team. But if you haven't watched that video, I would highly recommend it because it's pretty um, awesome to just watch something evolve. That's so amazing for kids. That's something that we've intentionally wanted to give the teachers the, the ability to kind of see what their students are interested in, how the curriculum goes, and then give them the ability to potentially purchase additional material spaces. So we're excited to see how those spaces evolve in the next couple of months here and even the next couple of years. Um, it wasn't something that we wanted to buy a bunch of fancy things that necessarily didn't get utilized. Um, so they look very great now, and we're hoping that it continues to get even better over the, this foreseeable future here. Oh, let's see, keep going here. Oh. So with the STEM programs, how will we afford these three teachers after the referendum expires? So we're hoping to continue to make efficiencies as we keep going right. here. We're also hopeful that as we get into the next biennium budget, the state might be able to supplement that difference. Mm -hmm. um, but the long short of it is if we continue to see the benefits of this program, and we might ask the community for continued ask if the state doesn't supplement or if we not, don't make the efficiencies required to, to the program. Do we know how aggressive other districts have been with putting STEM into the, the grade schools? Um, there's a couple districts in our area that have STEM programs, but not access for every single student the way we did. That's unusual in the area and across so, the state. That actually is what drew one of the new teacher um, to come to South Milwaukee to realize the what's going on in that program. So the 421 districts were once the, again a leader in education? or the implementation of education? Yeah, from the, the way in which we've chosen to approach it, yes. And we owe the thanks to all the people that voted yes on the referendum that we can offer this to our children. Yeah. Great. So another way that we've um, we've been able to see the referendum in this year is in the raise that we provided to, to staff. Um, so it's something we've worked closely on in the last, like in the last spring, talking about raises for staff and something that we've been able to, to hit the ground running this year and make sure that all staff have from the first day on. Usually we negotiate the current year's raise in the, in the spring. This year it's it's in motion already. So we were able to see a, an above inflationary increase for our, all our staff with uh, even a higher raise for staff who are in the earlier years of the, the teaching profession um, in order to provide them with an incentive to stay with the district. Uh, so that's an area that we of pride that we currently have. We've been also been able to provide over 6% raises for our paraprofessionals and clerical staff as well. Um, and just getting closer and closer to the area average and even higher in some, some cases in order to try to make, uh, retain those hard to fill positions. So as we look to 25, 26 and the next four years of the referendum, um, we're going to continue to work on, on traffic safety measures. Like we discussed, although it might be difficult to get those objective standards for success, um, something that we're going to continue to discuss and work on in the next couple years here. We'll continue to work on this, the school, the, the door safety measures and potentially look to start testing it in the field at an elementary school. Um, and we'll continue to support the STEM programs out of those rooms as student needs develop. Um, and just in general, just continue the good work that the community has entrusted us to do. So, so to go back to technology and network, um, with the addition of all these added cameras, is part of the network having the broadband to support? Yeah, to expand the network in order to support some of it. So we would have one localized, well, no, without getting into detail. Yeah, I, I guess I don't want to misspeak. I know Brian is, is, yeah, is here. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> but but yeah, we would have to expand the network to some degree. I know Brian. Is there anything you would want to add? To but, that? Yeah. The what? How much? How do we increase the broadband needed for these all these new devices? So surprisingly, the cameras coming back 
to our servers don't take up a ton of bandwidth mm -hmm. um, and it's all internal. So when you think about bandwidth, that's more out to the internet. Okay. All of our cameras are internal, right? So it's, we didn't have to make too many increases that way. It was more uh, adding things like switch space, things for them to plug into. Um, we had to purchase a couple extra switches to, um, to make up for those extra, extra devices, but that was about it. Okay. Even like, as we talk about the, 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 um, keyless entry points, we would have to add switches in or and entry points in order to, to put gateways is what they're called in, in hallways to speak to the, the doors. So, and then when you're looking at the pictures, it could be on a laptop, a center desktop. Is it also available like on iPads or talking about the security camera yeah. software? The, it's your... definitely available on a laptop. Uh, I guess I haven't seen it on a tablet, but okay. Um, well, the thought was if you have a security person, you know, they have the tab. I don't know if other schools use that, but that would be the next level instead of a centralized picture and then it broadcasts out. It's like, oh, I see my view that I need while I'm working. I don't know. Yeah, the new, the new software that we're going to be moving to for the cameras is fully web based okay so really you will be able to access uh, from any web enabled device all right thank you no questions on the report um, and just a reminder to everyone that there is a section on our website that says referendum updates so that, as promised, we're going to let the community know exactly where we spent each one of those dollars that they were um, generous enough to support for our schools. And so there we regularly add things to that as we have other things that we've spent the dollars on that we can make sure that people know where those dollars went. We, we try to like as we replace smart boards that still work, but are just a little outdated, do we try to like sell those or anything? Or are they at this point, you know, 15, 20 years old and kind of? Yeah, it's the, it's really difficult to sell technology in a lot of cases. When we can, we certainly do. But that's effectively a continued discussion we have is what do we do with our outdated technology? Here. Okay. I am. Okay, moving on to the recreation center. 